morning, everyone. It is time to begin our worship service. If you are a guest or joining us, we are great to have you here. Uh, if you wouldn't mind filling out one of the green cards in front of you, you can either leave that in the pew or put it in the collection tray as it goes by. And uh, if you all wouldn't mind silencing any cell phones or noise-making devices so they don't disturb our worship, we would deeply appreciate it. Our sympathy is extended to Hal Hunt and family regarding the passing of his mother, Pat, on Saturday. Visitation is today from 2 to 8 p.m. at Heritage Funeral Home in Fort Oberthorpe, and also Monday from 12 to 2 p.m. with funeral at 2 p.m. Interment will follow at Tennessee, Georgia Memorial Park. Concerning our sick or in the hospital, Kara Cass requests prayers for David Cass Sr. He is in the hospital in Florida with blood pressure problems that caused temporary blindness. He was able to leave Thursday, but had to return Friday. He is having more tests done. Teresa Tatum requests prayers for Reba McIntyre from Morgantown Church of Christ. She has stage four liver cryosis and is being considered for a transplant. We have several and many prayer requests in our bulletin for friends and family members suffering with cancer and various illnesses. Uh, please remember these in your prayers. For our general announcements, tonight following the evening service, we'll have a fellowship meal and everyone is encouraged to attend. On December 5th to the 19th, we will be collecting donations for holiday meals for needy families from East Ridge Elementary, and more info on that is to come. There is also a cookie bake and soup potluck planned for Friday, December 17th at 5 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Bring your cookie dough, decorations, and favorite soup. You can see Morgan Paris with questions. For our order of service, first prayer will be led by Reggie Carter. Closing prayer will be Pat Garrett. And scripture reading will be Micah Perry and Alex Clark. And Brother Bob Garrett will be leading us in song. Morning, everyone. We will start with number 231, 231.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful this morning that we can come together as thy body at this local, local congregation. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that we have this avenue of prayer, that we can come to thee and let our requests and our pleas be made known. We're also thankful that we can give thee the praise and the glory for the things that happen to us. We know that you are the author of all the blessings that we have. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that we can enter the, into this worship, that we can sing these songs of praise to the high and holy name. Let each song encourage us and give thee the glory and the praise for all. We're thankful for the ones that have prepared themselves for this service, uh, the teachers and the preacher and the, and the teachers for the classes to come after this hour. We're so thankful, Heavenly Father, that we have this great privilege of coming together at any of the times that we see fit and set that we can worship Thee. We're mindful and thankful for the elders, for the work that they do for the congregation here, and we pray that we can go forth in this community and give the light that everyone needs. We know that Your Word is the direction for our paths, and we pray that we can study it for that end and that we can do what we can to help others uh, see the, and understand thy word also. We pray again for the Lord's Supper coming forth. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we can have our minds set and go back to the uh, cross for the suffering that Jesus did for us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, we can be mindful of all these blessings that we have. Be with us again as we're singing more songs to thee. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Turn to number 504. 504.
Scripture reading today will be from the book of John. The book of John in chapter 19. The book of John, chapter 19, starting in verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of, the sol- uh, one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that he- ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him who they pierced. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day, thankful for this opportunity to gather. As we prepare our minds to partake of this bread, we pray that we do so in a manner pleasing to Thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Father, at this time we offer our thanks for that blood that was shed on our behalf. For thy son's blood represented by this fruit of the vine, we pray that we can partake of it in a manner that pleases thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
for our giving, we'll be reading from the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 14. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Heavenly Father, as we take this opportunity to return a portion of what we've prospered, we pray that these funds be used to do thy will, and we pray that we give a check with a happy and cheerful heart. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go to mark number 218, that'll be our song of encouragement after the lesson. 218. Before the lesson, we're going to sing 203. 203. If you have a Bible, would you join me please in the book of Mark, 
Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 would be the text for our study today. A few weeks ago when I was away in a gospel meeting, the last night of the gospel meeting, one of the college-age students came up to me and expressed thanks for the lessons. She's the daughter of a gospel preacher. And she, she gave me a note that I didn't read at the time, and I took it home and, and read the note, and she said, I enjoyed your old-timey preaching. She said, because it was book, chapter, and verse preaching. Now, if that makes you old-timey, I want to stay old-timey. And if I ever stop being that kind of uh, communicator of God's Word, then somebody needs to uh, pull me aside and say, it's time for you to step down. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 records an incident that's familiar to a lot of us where a, a young rich ruler came to Jesus and he asked Jesus, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And in his answer, one of the things Jesus said was, you take all that you have, you sell it, give it to the poor, and then you come and follow me. And he went away with great sorrow. And then a little bit later, Peter said to Jesus, well, Lord, we, speaking about himself and the other apostles, he said, we've left or forsaken all and followed you. What should we expect to receive? So you've got that incident of this rich young ruler goes away with sadness. And then Peter says, well, Lord, if you're looking for someone who's forsaken everything, we've done that. Well, in between that, there's a conversation in which Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God. He really did. It should show up here in chapter 10. Help me along there, Peter, if you would. Chapter 10, how about that? Go ahead to Mark 10. One more time. There you go. Let's look at that verse. And so remember the context where, where Jesus has spoken to this rich young ruler. Look at verse 23. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Verse 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth them again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. So, so what was it that led Jesus at that moment to speak this message to the disciples? Well, again, that rich young ruler who had great possessions, he went away with great sorrow because of what Jesus had said to him about giving all of that away and then coming and following him. So what you've got when you look at the end of verse 21 is the idea of following Jesus. And in verse 28 at the beginning of that, or the end of the verse, you've got the idea of following Jesus. So let me, let me say that again. Verse 21, following Jesus. Verse 28, following Jesus. But in between, you look at the last words in verse 23, the kingdom of God. The last words in verse 24, the kingdom of God. The last words in verse 25, the kingdom of God. And so following Jesus involves the kingdom of God. And so what I want to do in our lesson this morning, I want to focus on those five verses and see what we can learn from what Jesus said about the kingdom of God. So pull up that next one if you would, Peter. First of all, Jesus talks about entering God's kingdom. Now, 
In other passages of Scripture, we can learn about the establishment of the kingdom. Jesus doesn't address that topic here. In other passages, we can learn about the nature of the kingdom. What kind of kingdom is it? Jesus does not address that here. But when you look at the end of verse 23, the last words are, enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 24, enter into the kingdom of God. And verse 25, enter into the kingdom of God. You don't have to be an Einstein or Solomon to figure out Jesus is talking about something connected with entering into the kingdom of God. Now, now here, he's not going to discuss how does that happen. He's not discussing the door or the way into the kingdom. But he is talking about the prospect of entering. So was that even possible? Is it even possible for a human to enter the kingdom of God? Well, we recall what Jesus said. Jesus said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my God, which is in heaven, Matthew 7, 21. So Jesus spoke about the requirement for entering the kingdom is to do the will of the Father. You say, well, I don't know if I'm confused, but we're reading in Mark 10 about the kingdom of God and what you just quoted from Matthew 7 doesn't say the kingdom of God. It says the kingdom of heaven, which brings up a question. Are they the same or are they different? If you would, hold your place. We're coming right back. Look in Matthew 19. And what we have in Matthew 19 is a parallel record of what Jesus said to the apostles in this instance. In other words, we're reading in Mark 10, the same thing is found in, in Matthew 19 and some of the wording is a little bit different. Same incident. In Matthew 19, just so you can see the context, let's start in verse 22. Matthew 19, 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the what? The kingdom of heaven. Verse 24. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into what? The kingdom of God. So, so in verse 23, the kingdom of heaven, enter the kingdom of heaven. In verse 24, enter the kingdom of God. In the context, the same or different? The same. When we read that John and Jesus were preaching the kingdom of God is at hand and they were preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that was the same kingdom. So come back to Mark chapter 10. And, and one of the things we see here is this reality. It's possible for a human to enter the kingdom of God. That's the very thing about which Jesus is speaking. Okay? Entering the kingdom. Now, Let's look at some language here in Mark 10, some of which we've read and some of which we've not read. And let's make a comparison. Look in your Bible in Mark 10. When that rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked him a question, what was the specific question? Look at verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit what? eternal life. So, so there's a topic, inherit eternal life. And as Jesus answers that question, look at what, what we read in verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. So, so let's pause for a moment. Verse 17, the question was about inherit eternal life. Verse 21, part of the answer, treasure in heaven. Verse 23, enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, who shall be saved? So you got four, four concepts or four uh, descriptions. Verse 17, eternal life. Verse 21, 
treasure in heaven. Verse 23, enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, be saved. Four different concepts or one. In the, in the context, it looks like it's talking about the same thing. Now, there's going to come a time in the future when the Bible says that when cometh the end, Jesus will have delivered up the kingdom to the Father who gave it. 1 Corinthians 15 and 24. So if we want to be a part of the eternal kingdom there, we need to be a part of the Lord's kingdom as we live in this world, the kingdom being the church. And so entering the kingdom is a possibility, and we read about that right here in Mark chapter 10. But let's go on to the next phase, the next slide, if you would. How hard it is. Now, we might say it's really hard. <laughs> But let's read again verses 23 and 24. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, or how hard it is, in verse 24, the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, now at least twice, Jesus used the word hard or hardly or with difficulty. Not impossible, but in some sense, in some scenarios, it's hard for some people to enter the kingdom. You say, well, the problem is money. Well, in fact, the bottom line is not the riches. If all you read was verse 23, you might come away thinking that Riches endanger a person's spiritual well-being. But actually, a key thought is in verse 24. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that what? Trust in riches. There's a world of difference between possessing a pile of riches and trusting in riches. One might trust in riches who has very, very little money. One might trust in riches who has a gazillion dollars. It's not about the amount. It's about the attitude. And so what we see then is Jesus indicates that for some individuals, entering the kingdom is going to be something that's difficult. And here it's connected with riches. Now, we're going to expand in a minute, but in the context, when he's talking about difficulty or something hard to do entering the kingdom, he's talking about those who trust in riches. 1 Timothy 6 is a passage in which we, in which we read about a desire to have riches. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. And then in 1 Timothy 6, 17, we read that that Paul said to Timothy, charge those that are rich in this world, that is in material possessions, charge those who are rich in this world that they trust not in uncertain riches and that they not be high-minded, but that they trust in the living God. Well, what would be the definition of uncertain riches? A not certain, <laughs> no guarantee. No guarantee with our material possessions, right? They can be here this morning and gone this afternoon. And so the appeal in 1 Timothy 6 and the appeal here is not to trust in riches. Is it possible? Is it possible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God? Yes, it is. Is it possible for a rich person to be a loyal servant of Jesus within the kingdom? Yes, it is. Is it possible for one who trusts in riches to stop trusting in riches? Yes, it is. It's going to require a transformation on their part. It's going to, it's going to require a transformation of their thinking. They're going to have to realize that, that riches in a material sense, are nothing to compare to the spiritual riches that the God of heaven provides, but it's possible. Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3 
in verse number five. So, so that's how it happens. Here Jesus is talking about what makes it hard for some people. Now let's expand for a moment, okay? Let, let's expand and let's look at some other categories of individuals for whom it might be hard to enter the kingdom of God. We just talked about those who trust in riches. They've got to be untrusters. They've got to go from being one that trusts in riches to becoming one who doesn't trust in riches. Well, a second group of individuals who might find it hard to enter the kingdom are those who in this world have position, power, or prominence. Now, here's the reality. It's possible for any of those individuals to humble themselves and serve the Lord God of heaven faithfully and not even give up their position. But it's challenging. The Apostle Paul made the observation to the brethren in Corinth when it comes to those who are wise in this world, when it comes to the mighty, when it comes to the noble, he said, not many are called. 1 Corinthians 1.26. Now, 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 the gospel call goes out to all people. But in history, very few in those categories have been receptive to the call of the gospel. So, so why is it hard for them? Because there has to be a transformation of their thinking that says my position is not what's most important in my life. My prominence, my power, my IQ, that's not what's most important in my life. What's most important in my life is my service to the Lord Jesus. So there has to be a transformation of thinking. And that's hard for some people to humble themselves and repent of their sins and comply with what Jesus said. So one category of people, the ones mentioned here in the context are those who trust in riches. It's hard for them to make that choice and stick with it. A second group are those we just mentioned, the, the prominent, the powerful, the, the mighty in this world. A third group are those in whose heart sin has a stronghold. You, you see, having riches, that, that's, that, that's not sinful. Being in a powerful position, that's not sinful. There are some activities that are sinful and people enjoy the pleasures of sin and they're just not ready to give them up. There might be a person who is involved in some business enterprise and he is raking in tons of money. I mean tons of money. He's going to retire by the time he's 35 and live comfortably. But he's involved in immoral activities. It's going to be a challenge for him to give up that business relationship. Or there may be someone who's, who's living with a woman who's not his wife, or there may be someone who's in his 15th marriage and he's not divorced any of his 14 still living wives because of their fornication, and he knows good and well in the eyes of God he's living in a state of adultery. It's not easy to give that up. But you know what? Some have. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Verses 9 and 10, we read that the unrighteous, it's in the form of a question, but the point is the ungodly or unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And Paul mentions several different categories of individuals. He mentions drunkards, he mentions extortioners, he mentions idolaters, he mentions fornicators, he mentions adulterers, he mentions revilers, he mentions fornicators. He said none of those in meaning without repentance, none of those are going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then he, he turns to the past and he says, such were some of you. That's on your resume, so to speak. That's on the record of your life. Some of you used to be extortioners. Some of you used to be idolaters. Some of you used to be adulterers. But not anymore. You're washed you're sanctified, you're cleansed. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 6. And so it, it, it's hard for people to make that choice, to humble themselves, repent of their sins, and do what God says. Because sin does have pleasure, but it's possible. And then I mention a fourth category of individuals who in some cases may find it hard to enter the kingdom. And that is those who are steeped in religious error. Those who are 
fervently involved in some type of false religion. One of the marvelous statements in my, in my mind, one of the marvelous statements in the book of Acts is found in Acts 6 and verse 7, where in the city of Jerusalem there was a great company of priests, Jewish priests, who were obedient to the faith. Can you imagine? Religious leaders who left behind a religion that no longer was God's chosen religion to become obedient to the faith. Acts 6 and verse 7. And then in Acts 18 and verse 8, we read about a man by the name of Crispus in the city of Corinth who was the ruler of the synagogue. You know what he did? He became a follower of King Jesus. He heard the truth. He believed the truth. He humbled himself. He repented. And he came into the kingdom of God. It's possible. He said, well, I'll tell you, if you ever find anybody that's involved, not, not in the love of money, but just falling down before a stone or some kind of, you're never going to get anybody to stop being an idolater. Well, no, I'm not, but God can. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 9, we read about those brethren in Thessalonica who had turned from idols. They, they were idol worshipers. They turned from idols to the living and true God to serve him. You say, well, if you're talking about some denominational preacher, you're wasting your time talking to them. They're never going to change. Some have. It's not easy. Whether you're talking about trusting in riches or living immorally or, or steeped in, in religious or whatever it is, there are some individuals who are going to find it difficult to come into the kingdom. But the gospel has the power of God to change people's thinking to change their choices and to change their eternal destiny. Next slide, please. Who then can be saved? Who asked that question? Look in your Bible in verse 26. And they were astonished. It was not Jesus. They were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Who's asking? The disciples, the apostles. They've observed this. They've observed this rich young man who went away with great sorrow. And they may have thought this, this guy was incredible. I mean, to hear him talk about himself, the commandments, he had kept those things from the time of his youth. I've done those things. And in their mind, this may have, they may have thought, this is a, the perfect one to come into the kingdom. And he went away with great sorrow. And then Jesus adds on to that and says, well, you know, if you trust in riches, you, you, you can't go into the kingdom. And they're like, wow, you're serious. Well, in that case, who can be saved? Who can be saved? Is that a good question? Fantastic question. You know, in the book of Acts, we read about different individuals who ask a similar question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What must I do to be saved? When we ask that question, or when someone asks that question, you know, you know what there needs to be to accompany that question? There needs to be a desire to hear the right answer to that question. Not, not just to hear an answer. Anybody can throw out an answer. But when we ask that question, we need to come to the right source to get the right answer. And then when we get the right answer, we need to have a heart that's ready to accept that answer and to comply with that. Otherwise, what's the point of hearing the right answer? If you don't want to hear the answer, don't ask the question. Who then can be saved? Well, you can, can, can rich people be saved? Oh, yeah. Can non-rich people be saved? Yes. Can those people who used to trust in riches be saved? Yes. What about females? Yes. Males? Yes. Greeks? Yes. Jews? Yes. Jesus said, go and make disciples or teach all nations and preach the gospel to every creature. So every person of every race in every place, the door of the kingdom is open to all and only those who submit to God's conditions shall enter the kingdom. Now, last slide, Peter. Number four. Someone said, with God all things are possible. Who said that? Look at verse 27. And Jesus looking upon them saith, with men it is impossible. What's impossible? To be saved. But not with God. For with God all things are possible. 
So with God, if all things are possible, does that mean that God could tell a lie? Well, the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie, Hebrews 6 and verse 18. It's against God's nature to lie. This passage is not talking about God's nature. This passage is talking about verse 23, enter the kingdom of God. Verse 24, enter the kingdom of God. Verse 25, enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, be saved. In the context, what is it that is possible with God being saved? In the context, what is it that's possible with God entering the kingdom? You mean even people who trusted in riches, if they're willing to not trust in their riches? Now, let's be careful how we take that statement in verse 27. It may be suggested, well, if we put our mind to it, if we trust in God, we can do anything we want to do. If I am, don't have the physical body to be a fast runner, I can train and I can run and I can work out on the weights and I can watch my diet and I can work and I can train and I can work out and I'm never gonna be in the Olympics, let alone get a gold medal. So let's not carry this thing to mean something that it doesn't mean. So if we put our mind to it, we can do anything we want to. With God, all things are possible. If I am a male, M-A-L-E, I am never going to give birth to a child. That's not doubting God's power, it's just accepting reality. I'm never going to be the prime minister of the nation of India because you have to be a citizen of India to become prime minister. That's not doubting God's power, that's just simply saying, let's not make verse 27 say something that it does not say. In the context, The power is even for people who on the surface look like they may not be good candidates for the kingdom. With God, their thinking can change and their response to the gospel can change. Otherwise, what's the point of preaching repentance? If we don't think people are capable of changing their minds and changing their conduct, why in the world do we preach repentance? You say, well, we preach because Jesus said to. Well, what's the point? Because people have the potential to hear the truth, humble themselves, repent, and submit to what God said to do. And so as we look at prospects in our community and in our lives, what we sometimes tend to do is prejudge That's a short form of prejudice. We sometimes prejudge and look at that person and say, you know, I don't think she would be interested. Don't don't, don't bother with her. Or now, I don't think somebody that lives that kind of lifestyle, I I, I don't think think somebody like that ever be interested. Look, we all come with baggage. We all had to repent of something in order to become followers of Jesus. We had to turn away from that lifestyle of darkness The power is not in our ability to speak. The power is not in our niceness. The power is in the gospel. And the gospel can change people's thinking and change their lives and change their eternal destiny. That's why Peter preached, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, Acts 3 and verse 19. Does the gospel have the power to change a jailer in Philippi? Yeah. Does the gospel have the power to save a Jewish priest? Yes. Does the gospel have the power to to save a, a Christian hater like Saul of Tarsus? Yes. The gospel has the power to change lives and change people's relationship with God and change their eternal destiny. And in that sense, with God, even, what about that rich young ruler? What was said at that fellow's Funeral. What was written on his tombstone? We have no clue. Because we don't know the last phase of the man's life. Right? What we see a picture of that man is he went away from the Lord sorrowful. Was that the last day of his life? I have no idea. 
But in the context with God, all things, it was even possible for that rich young ruler who went away with great sorrow to think it over, change his mind. You remember Naaman the leper? When he first heard the instructions of Jehovah through Elisha, through the messenger, to go and dip in the Jordan River seven times, what was Naaman's response? His basic response was, I ain't doing that. His response was, he went in a rage. I'm not doing that. When he thought it over, did he change? Yeah. Was there the potential for that rich young ruler to think it over and at some point down the road change? Yeah. In that sense, with God, all things are possible. So bring it up if you would, Peter, the next one. Here's what we looked at in our lesson today. Not a message about how to enter the kingdom, per se. Not a message about the establishment of the kingdom, but Jesus spoke about entering the kingdom. We saw it in three consecutive verses. He spoke about how it's hard for some in the context for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom. Apostles were astonished. Who then can be saved? And then with God, all things are possible. Salvation by grace. If anyone's going to be saved, it's going to be by the grace of God. There's no such thing as being saved without God's grace. The gospel is called the gospel of grace. And by the grace of God, Jesus tasted of death for every man, Hebrews 2 and verse 9. The way of salvation is believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Repent of sins, confess faith, and then be immersed in water for the remission of sins. And then to live a life of faithfulness. And if we'll do that, we'll love the results. It's God's invitation. We need to respond. Would you come as you stand with us? There's a fountain free. It is for you.
us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us with all the many blessings of the family and the friends that we have. Please help those who are suffering either spiritually or physically, and help us as we go to our class that the teachers teach your word, and throughout the rest of the day, in Jesus' name, amen. Samuel. This is our last studied episode in David's life. That doesn't mean it's the last episode. Thank you, Danny. I wanted to share a paper with you that, that uh, Danny's passed out. If you didn't get one, we'd be glad to do that. Something that's helpful I, to me, I'll put it that way. And uh, there, so 
And uh, we're going to look at that first. Make just a little deviation in our approach to our lesson this morning. There. Let's bow our heads if you would. Thank you, Lord, for the day and such a beautiful day. And thank you for the precious life that you grant to us in your earth. We are blessed so greatly above and beyond what we ever need or deserve. But you are our God in heaven who looks after your children in such a great and wonderful way. We do pray your continued blessings to be with us because we need them each day of our lives. We ask your blessings upon your church here at Greens Lake Road that you would be with us and bless us, lift us up. Father, we pray for the souls round about us that you would add many souls to your kingdom here and that we might be encouraged to those round about us. And we're mindful of our brother Shane Shirley. Father, that you would be with brother Shane. We pray for his good health and strength to be restored to his body. Be with Melissa and their family in a good way. And other members of our congregation who are suffering from various adversities. We're mindful of the good health we do enjoy, the blessings you set before us day by day, the wonderful opportunities which are given to us. We pray for wisdom to use all these gifts to your glories. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. When, generally speaking, it's been my experience down through the years, when people come to the Old Testament books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, that's sort of a foreboding veil that's hung over them sometimes because they're, you know, in-depth details and all that sort of thing. But if you get the general idea and the flow of the content of those books, it kind of opens the doors to them. So that's the reason we decided to share this page with you here, an introductory concept to it in the Roman 1, 2, and 3, if you will. Number one, it says, general relationship in the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. Here, through A through G, tells basically the uh, content of these books. And if we know what they are in general, then it's going to help us a great deal when we open up the pages of either of those books. Chronicles is kind of like Second Corinthians in the New Testament. It doesn't get studied all that often. You know what I mean? There. First Chronicles, you know, if you put them in chronological, First Chronicles chapters 1 through, all those nine chapters of genealogy. Who wants to sit down and read all of that, you know? But they are important. We have genealogies in the New Testament, you know. We have one in Matthew and we have one in Luke about the genealogy of the Christ. Well, those are connected in reality to the back these back in the book of First Chronicles. Looking at the books of Samuel, which we have been spending our time in, first seven chapters, this is point B, first seven chapters simply talks about the judgeship of Samuel. He was the last of the judges. And so it makes a transition from the judges into the a monarchy or the kingdom, the kings, if you will. Then the remainder of the book of 1 Samuel 8 through 31 talks about the reign of King Saul in his, uh, in his life, if you will. So if, it's, if you want to read about the life of King Saul, you just go back to the book of 1 Samuel. That's where, that's where you find it. And basically the same thing is true in the book of 2 Samuel with the life of David. If you look at point uh, D there, and if you notice, there's two references there, 2 Samuel, the whole book, and then 1 Chronicles, chapters 10 through 29. That's the rest of the book of 1 Chronicles. And so you find that record of David's life and reign, not only in 2 Samuel, but also in 1 Chronicles, chapters 10 through 29. And so if you, you know, most people say, well, what in the world is in the book of, in the book of 2 Chronicles? Well, right there's there it is, 1 Chronicles, and then in 2 Chronicles, we're going to have Solomon. Point number E, and first 11 chapters of the book of First Kings and the first nine chapters of the book of Second Chronicles tells about the reign of King Solomon. And, uh, and then point F, we'll kind of get this one down if you don't mind. First Kings chapter 12 through Second Kings chapter 17 and then in 2 Chronicles 10 through 28, gives the history of the divided kingdom, Judah and Israel. Judah and Israel. And so you read about the kings in Judah and the kings in Israel, and it kind of switches back and forth, you know, probably there and that. But that's what you find in those seconds. And then when you get into 2 Kings chapters 18 
through 25, and on in the rest, rest of Second Chronicles 29 through 36, just talks about the surviving kingdom. So if you take your Bibles, and go over to Second Kings chapter 17 if you want to, right quick, just as a, just as a point to be made. I go to Second Chronicles, obviously, so that won't work. Really great areas of study in the Bible. And we allow so much, so little time. Let's see, what's the number that comes after 17? 18, is that right, Jenny? Okay, 18. Second Kings 17 and verse 18. It says, therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight, and there was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So I just have a little notation in my margin there says, end Israel. That's it for Israel. And so you're not going to read about Israel. You're going to read about Judah from this point forward in the text there. But it's good to know that when I go back and first, uh, you know, go back and in Kings there, and go all the way back into First Kings chapter uh, 12. You know, that's when Rehoboam came in to be the king there. And that's when the kingdom was divided. Now I go all the way over, all the way read through Second Kings and chapter 17. But when I get to verse 18, that's it. After that, the record is going to be about the, uh, not the divided kingdom, but the surviving kingdom. And a little note underneath that there, material in the two books of Kings presented in one book in the one book of Second Chronicles. So you have two books of Kings and you have the, that same material basically is found in the one book of Second Chronicles. And the Kings, book, books of Kings, treats the reigns of the kings of both Judah and Israel as they intertwine with each other. But Chronicles deals only with the kings of whom? Judah. So I'm not going to read about the kings of Israel over in the book of Chronicles. I'm going to just read about the, the, the uh, surviving kingdom as it's listed here. And the whatever mentioned relative to the kings of Israel, they're just sort of an incidental reference as they relate to matters pertaining to the kings of Judah. That's where it works. Now then, number two, chronological breakdown of these books. About four centuries of history covered in the books of First and Second Kings and the parallel passages in Second Chronicles, which has basically that same material. And the record begins with the ascension of Solomon to the throne, and that date is usually given about 971 B.C. And then it concludes uh, after Judah has been carried into Babylonian captivity. Final destruction of the city was 586 B.C. The first invasion by the Babylonians was what date? Six. 606, wasn't it? So that period of time there too. And so Chronicles concludes then with a decree from Cyrus, who was the overthrowing power of the Babylonians after the, after the Israelites had been in captivity for some 70 years there. And so Cyrus is going to issue a decree for the release of all Israelites who would return back to their homeland. And that was around 538 B.C. Now then, look at the general history. It divided three periods, okay? First Kings, 1 through 11, 40 years, the reign of Solomon. Actually, the first two chapters of the process of transition from David to Solomon in the process. And so you have about 40 years left. The first Kings chapter 12, that's the end of Solomon's life, down to the divided kingdom. What year did the divided kingdom take place? Pardon me. What year did the end of the divided kingdom take place? The end of the northern kingdom. 721 usually day. 210 years. So from the beginning of the divided kingdom, 1 Kings chapter 12, down to the end of that divided kingdom, some 210 years, and that record being pointed out in 2 Kings chapter 17. And we noted what came to an end in verse 18. And then in 2 Kings 18 through 25, have about 136 years from there, uh, remaining relative to the kings of Judah, the surviving kingdom, from the fall of Samaria 
and the Samaritan kingdom on down to Jerusalem being taken captive by the Babylonians. And so, you know, just this sort of information to me is very helpful in the process. And, the, and there's a final note toward the bottom there. First and Kings, Second Kings, originally one book in the Hebrew canon. And the same is true with First and Second Samuel. We have the same text, same, same words, just the organizational structure of it. And it seems to be that the Septuagint would be the first to make that division in those two books. So anyway, I thought that uh, you might uh, have some benefit to that. And if you have a place where you stuff little papers, sometimes, you know, you just go back and just kind of get in the habit of looking at those things. might be helpful. You never know. You never know. You never know. We're going to talk about David and Nathan in our last lesson today. David and Nathan. David is uh, one of the outstanding characters of the Old Testament. We looked last week at the shame in his life when he violated, uh, despised, I believe the word, he despised the commandments of the Lord and the fact that he uh, took Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, uh, committed adultery, and, uh, yeah, and as a result of that, ended up killing Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, plus other soldiers of his faithful, dedicated, loyal soldiers over in the battle against the Ammonites there. And uh, so not, not a pretty picture in David's life as such. And I, I, with this, this uh, you know, beginning next week, we're going to begin our studies in the book of Isaiah. If you don't have your book, that there's some on the table back there, so please be sure to pick one up. And read. That's the key to it. Read. And uh, the process. This is not the last of David's life, obviously, as such. Come and check chapter 12, the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12. Many things which are yet, are, yet are going to take place. But this is a significant event in, Dan, in David's life. And I hope we have just a little bit of time to mention some of those other events which take place uh, in the course of his life. Sin is a very serious thing, as pointed out in our study guide there, transgression of God's law. Back in the Garden of Eden, uh, what was the consequence of sin with the Garden when Adam and Eve took of the forbidden fruit and ate of it? Do what, Danny? Yeah, had to leave Eden, didn't it? It cost them their home and their relationship with God in the Garden of Eden, if you will, in the process. And uh, the Lord's hand is not short, and Isaiah says that he cannot save, neither is here heavy, will not hear, but your sins have separated between you and your God. And your iniquities have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So when we transgress God's will, sin, then we are separating ourselves from God. And that gets to be a very difficult thing, if you will. Can't hide it. Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, you know, every secret thing, you're going to be brought in that great day of judgment. Within the last verse in the book of Ecclesiastes, David thought he could hide his sin, at least tried to do so in various ways there. Was he successful in doing that? Absolutely not, if you will. And so God knows, dear folks, he knows everything that we do, who we are, what we say, where we go. He knows what's in our heart. And uh, it's, uh, and uh, do we wish, do, would we wish that God didn't know everything about us? <laughs> and... Uh, I don't, I don't think when you stop and think about it, you know. He knows everything about us, so he knows how to provide everything we need, doesn't he, Brother Reggie? So, and so a fellow says that it's somewhat of a, you know, to, to, to know that somebody knows, that, that changes things, what have you. Uh, if you have uh, done something which may not be as appropriate as it ought to be, and somebody else um, comes into your presence, and you know that they know that what you've done does that change your attitude and feeling? It's going to have an impact on how you think, doesn't it? Process. And so when we think about the idea that God knows everything within us, inside and out, if you will, then that ought to change our disposition toward the Lord. And uh, he that says he has no sin, John says, deceives himself, the truth is not in him, says, but if we confess our sins, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Great things, great consequence in that. David uh, went through great, uh, hmm, you make, makes you wonder, you know, why, why would someone like David think as he did? Well, he did wrong. When you do wrong, I guess the first inclination is to try to find some way not to have it exposed. 
unless you're just an outright radical and don't care and such. And so he tried to tried to cover it up. Bathsheba was a child, and so he ended up with these things taking place in his life. So, and uh, has con- sin has consequences. That's a great one of the great lessons I think we learn in this issue is, this issue with David and Bathsheba. Let's look at chapter 12, first four verses talks about the prophet Nathan. We were introduced to Nathan back in chapter 7 when David was given consideration to building a house for the Lord. And uh, on that occasion, that was a, a kind of a pleasant exchange with Nathan, Nathan in that day and age. And so we're introduced to Nathan again here in chapter 12. And uh, so I get in 2 Samuel instead of 1. And who sends Nathan to whom? Yeah, the Lord sends him to David. And this time the conversation is not going to be about something that's going to be pleasant, is it? It's going to be about something which is uh, not so pleasant, if you will, in the process there. And so, uh, there. And so here's what he talks about. How you doing? Good to see you. And uh, so 2 Samuel chapter 12 is where we're studying. And so Nathan comes and he came to him and um, Nathan presents what we call the parable of the little ewe lamb. Is what she, how it's usually labeled. The first four verses of chapter 12 of the book of 2 Samuel. It talks about two rich men. Had him, it said uh, two, um, you know, two men in one city, rich man and poor man. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. Verse 3. Poor man had nothing but a what? A little ewe lamb which he had bought. Been a part of his family. Raised it up. And someone says, I can't just imagine. I can't imagine having a lamb, you know, just grazing up, you know, having it on your lap and all that stuff. Well, you know, people who are agricultural man, you know, that's not, you know, that's just a way of life. Yes, sir. I, most, I don't know, I may not be so good to say most, but a lot of people anyway in the world have become very fond and very close with animals as such. We're accustomed in our particular current society, you know, to be sort of fond of puppy dogs and things like that. And what do we do with them? We bring them in the house, we feed them, we put them in our laps and we hold them and we pet them and we take care of them. We go down to the vet and pay out hundreds of dollars to get them checked out by the doctors and all that sort of thing. And you know, they are, and when, when that animal time comes to depart from this earth, it has an impact upon those who have had, you know, that, who that animal belongs. And that, that bond is made. You lamb? I don't know, we never had lambs when I was raising up. We couldn't even put one on the table, much less one out in the yard. So, and uh, so anyway, that's that's the that's the present, present, presentation that Nathan presented it to David. Kudos, I guess we could say to Nathan, because ordinarily, for someone to go, to especially someone who was the king, and to present something like this and draw the conclusion, which is obvious, obvious and unavoidable. It takes sort of a special fellow to do that, wouldn't you think? You know, just not just anybody's going to be too comfortable. Someone says, I don't know that Nathan was all that comfortable. Well, we don't know that he was or was not. We just know that what God told him to do is what he did. And he went and he presented this. And he presented it in such a way that it got exactly the, the exact response for which it was designed. And so here's what was presented to David as but such. And so it says... Verse 3 there, there was a poor man, had nothing but a ewe lamb in the process. And verse 4 says, there came a traveler unto the rich man. And so what did the rich man do? Did he go out and take one of his benny flocks and herds? No, he went over and took this one poor man's one little ewe lamb, dressed it, prepared it to feed the traveler. Well, what a nice gesture on that fellow to want to prepare food for a traveler. You know what I mean? But it wasn't really nice because he didn't prepare his own food. He took it from somebody else. And uh, so, boy, David liked that, didn't he? Or did he? No, he didn't like that. What did David have to say about that? Talked about his anger greatly kindled against the man. That's the rich man. Said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, verse 5, that man, the man that hath done this thing, shall what? Surely die. Surely die. You, you know, sometimes a fella can get, you can set a fella up, Brother Jerry, and he doesn't know it until it's too late. 
I think, you know, is that's what's happening to David here. David could see the inequity. He could see how wrong that, no problem seeing, seeing that what was taking place in the story that Nathan presented. No problem seeing that this rich man who had many, who had many rocks and herds, that he absolutely was, no way that you could excuse his actions on the process. And, and so David says, that man deserves to die. Deserves to die. Now that's more than the law of Moses really commanded relative to it. But he went on and did say this about it in the process. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing because he what? He had no pity. So you're going to have to restore him fourfold. And uh, why? Well, because he did it. The man did it. And because he had no pity in the process there and there. And uh, Nathan says, as the Lord liveth, uh, this, uh, this man shall die. And fourfold. Then verse 7. Verse 7. Mm -hmm. Verse 7. That famous statement from Nathan. Nathan said to David what? Thou art the man. I can kind of see David kind of get kind of weak kneed and course, <laughs> even strong as he was as such. And uh, he began to make excuses, accuse Nathan of, of false charges, or did he? He didn't do that, did he? David, being David, did what one ought to do in the process, in the process. He, he didn't have any difficulty whatsoever seeing the wrongness of the rich man and the way he treated the poor man and taking his one little ewe lamb as such. And of course, the uh, rich man in the parable was uh, comparable to whom? That represented David, didn't it? And the poor man that had the one little ewe lamb, that represented Uriah. And I guess the little ewe lamb then would represent who? Bathsheba. But she didn't, Bathsheba wasn't slain in the process. But anyway, the general thought is in the process there. So there he is. And so thou art the man, David. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. And Nathan goes on, and I don't know how much David needs to be reminded of this, but anyway, he was reminded of it in the process. And so here's what uh, some of the blessings that David had received. And he said, uh, here's what the Lord said to you. He says, I anointed thee king over Israel. David, you're king over Israel. Why? God said, I anointed you king over Israel. Remember back in chapter 16, 1 Samuel? David, I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. Remember all those days and months and even years in which were you were in flight for your life from King Saul who was seeking your life? God said, David, I took care of you. I spared you. And, uh, and all those journeys, if you will. And uh, then in verse 8, he says, I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives under thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And so you're king now. You got your, you, all that Saul had is belongs to you, everything in his house. That includes his wives. I don't know whether it's good or bad, but nonetheless it was. And that includes his wives and everything he had. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, Israel and Judah. And so Israel and Judah were brought back together under David's reign and process. And God says, I gave you those, those people. They're, they're the children of God. That's uh, And not only that, the Lord tells David, he says, I would... Moreover, have given thee such and such things. So, God prepared to do even more than that for David? Absolutely. No question about it. After all, he's described as a man after God's own heart. That doesn't mean that God approved of him. In fact, it says that uh, he displeased God. The last verse for chapter 11, just right before 12 there, it said, but the thing that David had done did what? It displeased the Lord, didn't it? It displeased him. And so here's God's faithful servant, if you will, his conduct in such a matter. And it, what he did is he despised the commandments of the Lord, David did. And of course it was a, shame, it was a shameful act. 
and not, not an act that would be representative of one of God's faithful, dedicated servants, if you will. And the great things are taking place here. And he said, David, I'd give you whatever you need. And so David, just look at verse 9. Despise the command of the Lord to do evil in his sight. David, did you think that when you were doing evil that uh, you were out of God's sight? Well, he wasn't. No matter what he thought, he was not there. And he says, David, says you have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. But I thought David stayed home over in Jerusalem while the soldiers over here at the town of Rabba and fighting against Ammon. I thought David was still at home. How did he do that? Yeah, he gave the commandment for his death, didn't he, Reggie? And that's the same as if David had done it. If he goes ahead and describes it here, he says, you've killed Uriah with a sword and you've taken his wife to be thy wife. And so you know when you write the things down and you hear it said out loud, the things that we do are not always as nice as we may think they are kind of puts the emphasis on them. You slain him with a sword of the children of Ammon. That's how David did it. So David was guilty of murder. No question about it, if you will. So there's a therefore in verse 10. Here's some of the consequences, the results of sin. David sinned. It says, therefore, verse 10, the sword shall never depart from thine house, why, Lord, because thou hast despised me. When someone despises the commandments of God, that's the equivalent of despising who? God. And the Lord, isn't it? Not, not, so. That's just, you know, so if you, if you violate God's word, then you're violating God. And so you despise me, you've taken the wife, you, you ride the Hittite to be your wife, and uh, he says, the sword shall never depart from thine house. And so he, it's not going to depart from his house, if you will. We're going to see that in just a little bit, a little bit moment here. And he says, not only that, in verse 11, I'll raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou did it sin secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the Son. So David's life from this point forward is changed dramatically. And he is not going to have peaceful days in his family and his life. And what takes place in the other episodes we could spend some time about in the rest of the book of Second Samuel and on in the first chapter or so of the book of First Kings, if you will, are matters which are not, are not very pleasant to think about at all, if you will. And uh, his son Absalom is one who's going to raise up in rebellion against him and literally, literally take over Jerusalem. David, David leaves the city, and if you will. He has incest in his own house between the daughter of... Um, uh, a son of one wife, a Hinnam, and a daughter and a son, uh, a daughter of another wife, which is who, who was the sister of Absalom. And so not, not a very good thing is going to happen in David's life. Now he's, uh, David's going back to faithfulness as far as he's concerned in, in that, but it's going to be some rough life. And remember how uh, David was on the rooftop and observed Bathsheba, sent for her and took her and there, if you will. Turn over to chapter 16, and I think I can see it close enough, in about verse 22. This has to do with the time in which Absalom, Absalom had a sister by the name of Tamar, and they were both from the same mother. And David and Absalom had a, had a half brother by the name of Amnon, and he was from a different. He was from Ahinoam, if I remember correctly. 
there from another wife of David's there in the process. And Amnon just became infatuated with his half-sister and wanted her to be his in a physical way. And Amnon had a friend by the name of Jonadab. And Jonadab said, well, now listen, Amnon says, you're, uh, you know, you're the king's uh, son here and what have you. So he made, they draw up a plan. So Amnon's just going to pretend sickness, if you will. And when David finds out, he's going to send to it. He's going to request that David send Tamar over to provide food and sustenance for uh, Absalom and his recoveries. The process. And that works out just exactly like that. And though when she gets over to do that, he sends all the men folks out and then he takes advantage of Tamar as such and, uh, and spoils her uh, virginity. And so it was, and Absalom didn't appreciate that. Now he didn't act immediately at that time, but he said in his heart right then, that mo- moment, he was going to take vengeance, if you will, in behalf of his sister Tamar. Two years later, Ammon had a sheep shearing party, I guess you could call it, and invited all the sons of David over to that party, and even David himself, although David didn't go in the process. And while he was there, he gave orders to some of his servants under certain circumstances they were to inflict death upon Amnon, and they did. And so Absalom killed his brother Amnon. And so that comes, and then Absalom would flee, and he would go over to his father-in-law's house, Talmai, who was the king of Geshur, and he stayed over there three years, and finally he was brought back through the helps of Joab in the process, and Absalom would stand outside the gates in the city of Jerusalem, and people would come in, they would have issues and need judgments and things like that. Nobody was there to take care of them, and so he would step in, and the record says he stole the hearts of Israel. That's what he did. He got enough people favoring himself that he was able to invoke a rebellion against David, and he did. He pretended to go away outside the city of Jerusalem on a religious matter to fulfill a vow he had made, and David agreed to that in the process. And then he gave us orders to signal when he got certain signals that all of those who were going to be supporters of him, they would rise up and they would be uh, followers of Absalom and they would dispose David as king. Word got back to David on that, rather than go up and fight against his own son, David takes his household basically and his uh, bodyguards, the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and he leaves Jerusalem. He goes back over across the Jordan River to a place called Mahanaim over there. there. And uh, rather than enter into battle against his own people there in Jerusalem, Absalom wouldn't let the matter lie. I remind you of Asahel back early when he wouldn't let the matter lie when he had issues against Abner. He wouldn't let the matter lie, so he was going to go back over there and he was going to finish the job, if you will, against his father David. The only thing is, he was unsuccessful, and that's the occasion where Absalom and fled. He had hair, notable hair, caught it in the boughs of the oak tree, and he hung himself and put himself back to death. And so that sort of thing is what David's life was made up of after that. And it was not, a good, not, not good like it had been before, and that sort of thing. So. A lot of events taking place in David's life. Let's go back to 2 Samuel. Let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 16, where we were going a while ago. I think I said that right. And how David had uh, been on the rooftop and uh, uh, let me see if I can find my reference here again. My, my glasses aren't working very well, folks. I'll tell you what. Chapter 16 and verse 22 or 3, I think is what I got here. And, uh, okay. Go down about verse 20, chapter 16. Absalom then said Absalom to Ahithophel. Ahithophel, by the way, was one of David's faithful counselors who defected when Absalom raised up insurrection against David, and he went with uh, Absalom. So David lost the counsel there. And uh, so Ahithophel's advice, his counsel to Absalom was go into your father's concubines, which he had left to keep the house. David had left 10 when he left Jerusalem. He had left 10 there, if you will. 
And all Israel shall hear that thou art whore of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So Ahithophel's counsel to Absalom on this occasion is, said, your father left ten of his concubines there in Jerusalem and said, you go up unto them if you will, and everybody's going to know that you know that you're despised by your father. And that's going to be one means, at least by Ahithophel's thinking, that, his, uh, that uh, Absalom's hand would be strengthened among the people, if you will. Well, Absalom did that. They spread a tent were on the top of the house. Absalom went in under his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Uh, do you suppose, except that, do you suppose it's probably the same house, the top of the same house that, that David was where he was when he overlooked and saw Bathsheba? Doesn't say that, but since he's taking David's place, you would think he's going to take David's headquarters too, wouldn't you? His house in the process. And so it is, and uh, so the council of Hithophel, which he counseled those days, was if a man acquired, you know. And so what Absalom did, he did it openly and publicly, what David had then done privately. And he did it to ten of David's concubines in the process there. So the consequences really are, it's amazing when you stop and think about it, if you will. And so... So he did it openly. And here's David's response. This, this, is, this, this is the David that we know more about. Verse 13, David said what unto Nathan? I've seen. He didn't, as we suggest, well, he didn't argue with Nathan. He said, well, I didn't, didn't really mean to. You know, I, you know just, he, didn't, he didn't make excuses. He didn't, he didn't offer, he didn't get angry with Nathan for having presented the truth to him. He just says, I've sinned. Just that simple in the process. And he says, I've sinned against the Lord. And, uh, and then the, the amazing thing in the latter part of that verse when Nathan said back to David, what? The Lord also hath done what? Put away thy sin, thou shalt not die, which was... The, the administrative penalty for adultery. And so, and so obviously David's repentance is that. We often reported back to see David's feelings of the 51st Psalm. I'd like to take just a minute to go with you to Psalms 51 and just see the, uh, get the feeling for it, I guess is one way of putting it, of David's uh, agony. Yeah, but when someone repents, as David probably had, God forgives. Doesn't take a day and a half, two days, or three weeks to get it done. And so here is the Psalm of David, and the heading on that, which is not an inspired heading, but it says, When Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. And, uh, and so for the rest of his days, you think David just forget about that? Well, you can be forgiven, but you know it's there, isn't it, process? Verse 4, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. If you well, David actually committed sin against Uriah too, didn't he? But ultimately all sin is against whom? Against the Lord God, isn't it? And so here's what he uh, brought his household from David's. Uh, how many wives did David have? Do y'all count them up? He, he can't. We, we know the names of eight of them, by the way, in the scripture. And uh, three of them are of significance uh, in the process. And of course, Michael was a significant wife of David. And Michael was the daughter of whom? Saul, well, yeah, daughter of Saul. 
And then when uh, David had the encounter with this fellow by the name of Nabal, who was called the churlish fellow, and Nabal was stricken dead, he had a wife whose name was Abigail. And then, of course, there's the one that David encountered in Jerusalem who was Bathsheba as such. And, uh, and uh, so I believe it's about chapter 3 and uh, on back where it gives a list of the names of the others. Let me go back and look just to be sure. Chapter 3 of the book of Second Samuel there talks about who her sons are born in Hebron, the firstborn, Amnon. That's the fellow that... Uh, took advantage of his half-sister and on down through there. And it gives us about eight of them down through there. And uh, David's wives, these were born to David in Hebron. And then, of course, after he went up into Jerusalem, he added more wives and concubines to his household. Plus, he got those which came from King Saul. And so, uh, the fellow says, he was just setting up trouble to go, wasn't he? And so, David's life thing, David's response, I've sinned and uh, that. Didn't try to transfer the blame and uh, uh, give great occasion, said for the Lord, the enemies to raise up and uh, blaspheme. Can you think about the impact something like that would have around? Well, how, what kind of relationship did David generally have with the people around about him? They had pretty good, wasn't it? And the fellow says, if you want to get up and have a fight, David would take care of that if you needed to, for I said. Seemed like during his time there, there was a pretty, pretty good relationship, at least with part of the Philistines even, which were perpetual enemies of the Israelites, generally speaking, there. And, of course, they're having these issues with Ammon and the Ammonites this particular time. But, you know, he, he, David had a way of getting along with people because he just uh, was blessed by the Lord God in the process of doing it. When David, in flight from Saul, and his mother and father needed a place to have Safety, where did he take them? Remember? To the king of what? Mo? Moab. King of Moab. And so, you know, so he had those. David spent a year and six months down in the Philistine, a year and four months within the Philistine lands when he fled from fall uh, under the favorship of King Achish. And that, so. But now here's David, and he's dishonored. And uh, that. What do you think his soldiers would think about him? I didn't think. Remember back over in chapter, what is it, 29, where he has uh, the list of great faithful servants of, of David listed there in that chapter? And uh, 30, especially those great 30. And uh, let's see if I can. Uh, 23. 23. 23. And, uh, so here, and one of those being Uriah the Hittite, and uh, with the three, six leaders they had there. 37 all in all in the process. And, you know, what? how do you think those soldiers would feel about their commander-in-chief now? be kind of hard, to, kind of hard, wouldn't it? Let's look at our questions, and two or three other things I want to touch upon if we can, if we have time, and we'll just take the time to do that. Questions, questions, questions. Why did David, why did Nathan, the question said, why did Nathan comfort David? Huh? Lord sent him there. I just raised the question mark over the word comfort. David really wasn't too comfortable after David Nathan got through with him, was he? But nonetheless, he, he went because God told him to go in the process. And uh, uh, I, uh, you, do you suppose? Do you suppose that David once being approached by Nathan? And in the approach that, uh, that Nathan took with him about the parable of the little ewe lamb, that once it became evident out in the open, if you will, thou art the man, do you suppose that that might relieve David a little? But finally, you know, because he's not going to hide it anymore in the process. And of course, I hadn't been able to hide it any up to this point, really already. But uh, now it's now it's openly exposed for what it is, without question, or what have you. So it might have been some some degree of that, especially since David was of a penitent spirit in the process. Number two, what did the rich man take from the poor man in Nathan's uh, story? Took his little lamb, didn't he? Made a meal out of it for 
traveling man, probably a stranger. And uh, so some stranger ate that poor man's little ewe lamb for dinner. They said, that don't sound nice. It's not. Number three, what did David initially say should happen to the rich man? Surely die. No question about it. How did God uh, care for David? How had God cared for David? What are some of the things he'd done? Made him king, didn't he, Natasha? Well, First Kings, uh, First Samuel 16. God sent Samuel over to where? Bethlehem. Household of who? Jesse. To select one of Jesse's sons to anoint as king. And of course, David was the one ultimately who was selected in that process. What else did he do for him? Gave him what? He gave him the house of the adversaries. Okay, he certainly did that, didn't he? Yeah. David lose any battles? And really? I said, I felt he had a pretty good record, didn't he? Come to want to go to battle. David could have killed his own adversary, Saul, at least on two occasions, evidentially without any question whatsoever, but would not do so in the process. Yeah. And uh, so he took care of him that particular way. Anything else you can think of? Recipient of all of Saul's. Do what, Danny? Get Saul to kill him. Oh, kept Saul from killing him. Yeah, sure did. Sure did. Okay, number six. Uh, what did Nathan say David did to the commandment of the Lord? He despised it. Uh, when we today, as Christians, when we open in violate the commandments of our Lord. Any real difference between us doing that and what David did? The fellow says, well, our sins are not as big as David. Well, how big do they have to be before? Uh, you know, how big? Yeah, who put the bigness concept on it? There? And so when you think about that, you know, oftentimes we see brothers and sisters sometimes and uh, uh, who in confession, of course, things, you know, life gets involved in, in things and doing things that ought not be. And they'll make statements, of course, you know, I've brought shame and reproach upon the Lord's church. And how so? Because of that. And when we despise the commandments of our Lord or His church, it's the same as despising our Lord. That's a sobering thought when you stop to think about it ought to at least cause us to stop and give due consideration to our actions and what we're doing and going about doing in our world, in the world in which we live. And uh, so what about number seven? What would never depart from David's house? Sword. And you can mark it down in the, in the life of David once again. You can take David's life from the time he was a shepherd boy out near Bethlehem there and first uh, becoming God's servant from the day he went over to the battle where the Israelites in battle with the Philistines and took his brother's bread, and all the way up until the time uh, of going through the issues with, with King Saul and uh, being the king down in uh, uh, Hebron there, all the way up until the time of Bathsheba. This one point in his life, everything was just kind of on uphill, improving life. The fellow says life is just getting better, if you will. But when it gets to that point, just take a turn. It's going to go downhill for David. And life is not, you know, it doesn't mean he couldn't be a faithful servant, but it does mean those actions had a bearing upon his life, really, for the rest of his life. That's not unusual in our day and age. Somebody can find themselves in a situation and their actions can have consequences that are far beyond what they ever envisioned that they could have had in the process. What would happen to the child that Bathsheba was expecting? We didn't get on down to that part. Child died and uh, said that God came to David, verse 13, said uh, seven years of famine. Whoops, wrong, wrong chapter, Jim. And so, uh, so, and so that child that was born and uh, to David, and someone said, well, why take it out on the child? Well, not taking it out on the child, just a matter of uh, things take place there. And uh, uh, says this in, 
uh, verse 14, because of this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemy's Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And so Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck that child, the child that Uriah's wife bare, and it was very sick. The child was very sick for at least about seven days at least, and David mourned the sickness of the child, and uh, he, uh, that for seven, seven days. And when the child died, what did David do? Stopped mourning, went back in and started eating, put on his regular clothes, if you will, about and we might say he just got on with his daily affairs of life in the process. And someone said, and when the servants came to him a question about it, he says, well, when the child was sick, you know, there was some hope that he might be able to recover. But once he's dead, he said. And so you have that statement that is made there in verse 22. He said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live, but now that he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And here's a statement that's often repeated. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. I've heard those statements made from, over the years from time to time at funeral services, especially when it involves children as such. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And so, point being, David says, the time is going to come when I too will die, as his child did, and we will be in a similar place in the process. Really wonderful thought to think about in a way, if you will. Let's look at just a thing or two before, we, while we have a half a, half a minute here in the process. Um, what do you think is, why, one of the kind of discussion questions, why do you think it's easier to see sin in others' lives? When David heard the parable of the Ritter Ulam, he didn't have any trouble seeing that, did he? Yeah. Why do you think it's easier to see sin in, in others' lives? Don't want to see it, do you? But it says the mirror don't don't reflect too well, and maybe so. And that, but point being, sometimes that's the case. And of course, our Lord's teaching relative to those matters in the Great Thermon on the Mount is, and uh, before we, st uh, you know, start trying to. Uh, be hypercritical, if you will, or just hypocritical would be a better word for it because that's the Lord's concept of it. And uh, making judgments relative to other, pe other people's sins, there needs to be something else taking place first. What's that? Our own. We need to be able to look at our own. David was an individual who, uh, credit to his own self, when David was face to face with the fact and the reality unavoidably so, I wouldn't say that David was not unaware of the fact of his situation prior to that, but he's now faced with unavoidably so. David uh, said, you know, I'm, I sin. I sinned against the Lord. Now David's in a position where he can do something else. In the process. Okay. You've all been so good and kind, and we just appreciate it so much. Next, don't forget your book on Isaiah, and uh, be studying the lesson for next week. And uh, read the text. Isaiah is another one of those great Old Testament books and a lot of times folks have difficulty with. But I hope and pray that in our process of looking at that book that you'll learn to really appreciate it. We'll look at it and we'll learn something about the structure of the book and the great lessons which are presented therein are just uh, so needful for us still in our day and age. Let's, let's close with prayer. Thank you, O oh Lord, again for such a beautiful day. Thank you for your love for us. and Thank you for your servants of old, whose lives we have record of by divine inspiration, and from which we can learn things which helps us to be better and more fruitful servants of thine, which our prayer is it will always be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you.